So I want to finish what I started last week, which is not in the handouts. Okay? Uh, Troy's heard a little bit of this but uh, from when we went to lunch. But uh, I wanted to share something with you, and, and so you may remember this. We'll open here with a word of prayer in just a moment. But uh, just a, a beautiful explanation of Genesis 15 um, that was embedded in a sermon I listened to on 1 Peter chapter 1. So we'll go to 1 Peter 1 to start, and then we'll go to Genesis 15. Uh, so today in the notes, I have 11 pages for me, 6 pages for you, for one verse. So... I mean, the Lord saw fit to give Paul one verse, and we've turned it into 11 pages. Uh, it's a particularly thorny text, actually, and I'll share some of that with you later. A lot of it's intro. Um, I originally intended to do the entire thing, but it would have taken, I don't know, some time to finish. So uh, at 2 in the morning, I decided verse 12 was enough at 11 pages. So anyway... Uh, if you'll turn to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. And uh, I, I shared some of this last week, and, and just I'll do a quick kind of intro. I think that uh, the next book of the Bible that I'll teach when I hit my 70s is the book of 1 Peter. <laughs> uh, uh, will be the book of 1 Peter. And... Um, uh, I mentioned this a little bit, and I don't want to go into too much detail. I get nervous if I fuck him out on a limb theologically. Like, that's a dangerous thing, right? Like, I'm not that smart. So, um, but when I look at the Western church, I have started to wonder if the lampstand that we read about in Revelation uh, chapter 2 um, the threat to the church at Ephesus is to remember your first love or I will come and remove the lampstand. Um, I'm beginning to wonder if the lampstand is being removed at, from the Western church. I mean, that we know, and this is, I think, an important point, Revelation was written to Christians then and Christians today. Right? It was written to Christians then and Christians today. So the letter to the church at Ephesus that we read about in Revelation 2 was written to the church at Ephesus at that time. It's not a figurative church. It was written to that church. And by the way, was the lampstand removed? Well, and I'm working on the notes for this section that we're going to cover. And... Uh, uh, one of the heresies that is dealt with by the church is dealt with at the Council of Ephesus in the 400s. Now, I've not been to Ephesus, but I've seen pictures of it. Have you? It's a rubble. Yeah. Ephesus was raised. So the lampstand was removed from the church at Ephesus. So we know that this can happen. And of course, we know that the church moved to Rome at one point, right? During the time of Emperor Constantine as the seat of the church. Uh, and for several centuries, they did the right thing. And the lampstand has been removed. And I think we can argue earlier than the Reformation that it was removed. But certainly it resulted in the Reformation. You know, very few people come in here where I feel this excited about. <laughs> Welcome back. And look how well you're walking. Yes. Well, she's always had a nice walk. Well, I'll leave that to you, my friend. It is good to see you. It is wonderful. Good to be seen, honey. Yeah, my dad says that. Good to see Anyway, so we know that the church, at some point, that the lampstand was removed from the church in Rome, right? At some point, they began to fall off with <coughs> false teaching. <coughs> and so we fast forward, and you get to the Reformation, and so you think of the churches that were spawned initially out of the Reformation, right? Presbyterian Church, uh, the Lutheran Church, 
than the Anglican Church in England. I think you can make an argument that the lampstand has been removed from them. Uh, and what really got me thinking on all of this, uh, notes up at the front on the table, so that you have to take the long march forward. I was about forward. to say, march of shame. I just didn't know where to put them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I get a little nervous when I'm out on a limb a little bit, right? But I'm thinking, I, I saw the Anglican Church's uh, comments that they are now going to, and I mean literally the Church of England, they're now going to bless gay marriage. And so, you know, the Methodist Church went down that path. The Presbyterian Church, at least one branch of them, has gone down that path. Um, and I'm thinking, man, wow. And so, uh, and I think I shared with you last week the comments from the, the bishop, I think maybe in South Africa, um, from uh, uh, when the Methodists went down that path. And they said, well, you know, there's a lot of money tied up in this if you don't give up on this. And his response was, you keep your money, we'll keep our Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then, on top of that, you see the number of missionaries that are being sent from what we used to call third world countries that are now coming to America to preach the gospel. So what, what's happening for me is that I see that the church has lost its teeth here. Now, I don't think, you know, we're talking big kind of grand things, right? We're not talking about necessarily First Baptist Church Sheridan, okay? Um, or, you know, I think there are a lot of faithful churches. Anyway, so I have this theory and I, I'm, you know, I get, like I said, I get pretty nervous if I feel like I'm out there on, on the edge. I mean, learn Greek before you even try and do that, right? And so... Uh, so I was talking to my friend Tom Hovestall, and I go, Tom, I've got this theory. What do you think? And he goes, oh, I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. I think we've seen that. Well, now I feel a little better because I have pretty good respect for Tom Hovestall, right? And, uh, and so I asked Tom, I go, okay, so what does that mean for a, to be a pastor at a church in a region where this might be the case? Like, where do we go? Right? What does that do for us? And so he said, well, I think the key is, and, and part of it for me is this idea that really we should be doing the same thing, right? We should be preaching the gospel. We should be worshiping God. We should be in prayer and all of those things. And I go, so what does that actually mean? And he goes, well, I think you preach to a remnant. I think the idea is you prepare the church to be in that setting. Right? And I think clearly we're seeing a transition in America uh, where there was a time where it was cool, okay, whatever, to be a Christian, and now we're moving to a time where that is not the case. Right? I think it's in a transition, uh, a transitory stage, but, but I think we're moving in that direction. Anyway, so, so as I began to um, do some study personally on 1 Peter, First Peter is written to the church in exile. Okay, that could be us. And so anyway, so that's what led to this. Um, and this guy that, that, uh, that did this sermon is, uh, he was at Masters when I, right before I got there, he left. Um, and he spoke at all of our camps. He was the, the dean of the um, youth ministry department in the Bible department there. And so he, he gave the sermon on 1 Peter chapter 1. He was expositing 1 Peter back in 2018. Um, and by the way, had some similar ideas about us, the church being a remnant. And so um, just wanted to hit this with you and then we'll see what time we have remaining. But uh, it's actually a, a pretty important passage. There's a lot of debate in 1 Peter. Is 1 Peter written to Jew or Gentile? I would argue it's written to both. Um, there's language that says, that would indicate that it's written to a Jewish audience, but there's also some language that would indicate it's written to a Gentile audience, and commentators split. Um, I take the easy route and say, you're both right. I guess, I don't know. Anyway, so 1 Peter 1 here. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Galatia Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God. 
Uh, let me uh, grab these for you. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And then does it say sanctified by the Holy Spirit for the, Spirit. For the obedience of the Lord Christ. Jesus Christ? Obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Um, and it was just a beautiful sermon. Again, this is uh, this is not Romans, I know, uh, but I just wanted to share it with you. And so he talks about a couple of things here. He talks about the elect, right? We're chosen. So talking to this group of people, and and he suggests, and I think that he's right, that First Peter is written to a group of people who are who are basically asking the question. Have we been abandoned by God? Right? We've been exiled. Um, the word exile here um, could be translated aliens or foreigners. Right? They've been exiled to a foreign land during the time of Nero. Okay? So again here in 1 Peter 1. And he says, uh, he says to them, and you also see the word dispersion, right? They've been dispersed. And so he says to them, no, you're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. Okay, so you're chosen. And then he says, sanctified by the Spirit or of the Spirit for obedience to Christ. And then finally he says, uh, for obedience to Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. Okay? So the point that he was making, that Peter was making is, no, you're not abandoned. The entire trinity is involved in the security of your salvation before God. Sorry, I don't have to say that. You need help. Yeah, help. I was trying to find where you were. He reads it way better than I do, though. He has a nice voice. Yeah, he does. How to do it. Okay. So, anyway. So all three members, all three members of the Trinity are involved in it. Now, in his sermon, and I'm not gonna, I'm not preaching First Peter, obviously, right? We're not teaching that today, but I, this is where we left off. So then he talked about what the phrase sprinkling with the blood meant. He said that's a very specific meaning to a Jewish audience. It's a very specific meaning to a Jewish audience. So turn now to Genesis 15. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this. We're not going to read it all. But this is the part where Abraham says to God, Look, you said you were going to give me a kid. Uh, have you seen how old we are? Like, maybe you should take my servant. And we can make the promise go through my servant. And God says no. And he brought him outside and said, this is uh, verse 7, Look towards heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said, So shall your offspring, offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And then he makes this point. And he said to them, sorry, that was verse 6. Uh, verse 7, And he said to them, I'm the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. He makes the point that Abraham obviously knew that he was from Ur of the Chaldeans. But that God is specifically mentioning that. And here's why. You'll remember this uh, from Genesis 15. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And, and God said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Right? And you remember this. Right? They split, God splits them asunder and passes through this, right? You remember this? Okay. Now, this is apparently a Chaldean covenant custom. It's not an Israeli or a Hebrew covenant custom. It will kind of be drawn from in the temple sacrifices, but this is a Chaldean covenant custom. And so... Uh, my friend Dewey was making, I love that name too, Dewey, 
Um, his name is actually DeWilio, so I, maybe Dewey's better. But um, Dewey was making the point that God is saying, or the Chaldeans, to say, hey, we're going back to that. I want you to hear this. Right? We're going to use the sacrifice. So here's what they would do. They would prepare, get the animal ready to be sacrificed, and they would dig a trench. Okay? And they would sacrifice the animal, and the blood would run from the animal into the trench, right? And one half of the animal would be on one side, one half would be on the other. And the covenant would be then that you would walk through this bloody trench. Okay? And the idea, of course, and I'm sure you all know this, but the idea, of course, was when you walk through the trench, um, you're saying, may this happen to me if I break my covenant. If, my, if I break my promise. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay. So, here's what happens. Let's skip down. Verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. A deep sleep because there's no way Abram can keep this. That's a preview of what, what we're about to say. And behold... Dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, verse 17, and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt, and so on. And he describes the place. Uh, now, maybe you would heard this before. I've never heard this before. Right? <laughs> Here's, here's what this guy Dewey was saying, and I think he's, I think he's right. Um, so, cover. <laughs> I will keep my word. And then the next person walks through, and what do they say? I'll keep mine. Typically between two people, right? One person walks through, you know, I'll give you this land, right? Another person walks through, okay, and I'll pay you this much for it. And I'll keep my covenant and under penalty of death. Here's the problem. Abraham's part of the covenant is that he would be holy as God is holy. Right? That he would perfectly, obediently follow God's call. Well, we know that Abram struggled with that. Right? I mean, how many times did Abram say that, hey, Sarah, tell him you're my sister. I mean, right? I mean, we, we could go through and find the many times that Abram struggled. Abraham was not perfect, right? One perfect man, Christ. Um, and so, according to the covenant, if Abraham walked through this trench, what would happen to Abraham? He would die. So, this is the part that was just amazing to me. The smoking fire pot, other places in Scripture, is symbolic of God. Smoking fire pot walks through. God walks through the trench. You can trust my promise. But a flaming torch, other places in Scripture, is also symbolic of God. In other words, the flaming torch went through the trench to say, Abraham, you will fail at this. But instead of the penalty of death going to you, it will go to me. Of course, we know that that's in the person of who? Jesus, Jesus Christ. So here's this thing that I've read, I don't know how many times, this passage. And just like, oh, okay, that's weird. I mean, let's be honest, that's weird. Right. Cut them in half and flaming torch and a smoking pot will walk through. Okay, cool. All right, don't get that one. Really what it is, it is a picture of Jesus Christ. It is a picture of God saying, 
Abraham, you can trust my promises. I'm going to walk through this. Abraham, you can trust my promises. When you fail, because you will, the penalty will not go to you. Rather, it will go to me. It will go to my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful picture? So, that's where we left off last week with time, and of course I didn't get through it. So, All right. Any thoughts on that before we continue? Yeah. Two thoughts. First one, it's a unilateral covenant. Mm -hmm. Abraham is not responsible. Secondly, yep. verse 6. Verse 6 says, it's by faith. Yep. And so, it's right Abraham him is, is counting on God's truthfulness yep. and his capability of keeping Amen. the covenant. Amen. Well said. Anyone else? Well, does, yeah, but I, I can't remember where the verse is. It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Mm -hmm. But every time the blood is mentioned in the whole scripture, it is referring to Jesus' death. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think just all the foreshadowing and so forth, and the very poor advice I got as a very young seeker saying, well, you can skip over the old testament and just go to the new. Yeah. Well, yeah, you can start there to find out who Jesus is. But when you see all the foreshadowing and the prophecies and so forth, it's it, it <coughs> discount yeah. and discredit Amen. too much. You know, mm -hmm. not looking at both sides. Yeah. Okay. Great so, point. Yeah. Great point. Okay. Let's pray and then we'll get into why we're actually here in Romans. How about that? Uh, no wonder it takes us so long. Us. I like how I pass that off on you. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much that you love us so much that when you covenant with us, you provided a means for us. Father, that in our sinful way, we, there is no way that we could keep a covenant with you. God, that our... All you require of us is belief. Father, that when we believe, you reckon it to us as righteousness. <coughs> Father, thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, and thank you for this beautiful picture of the work of your Son for us. God, as we get into Romans here, I pray that, uh, that you would embed it into our soul. God, give us grace as we approach this difficult passage. Um, God, again, thank you for the people that you've gathered here today as we continue to study your word. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So, as I mentioned, uh, your six-page handout is on Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, I'm going to actually start a little out of order in my notes. This isn't in your notes. I mean, it is. It, your notes says, difficult passage to interpret. But I want to read you three quotes, okay? So I think pretty highly of John MacArthur, right? I, I went to the school where he's the president. You know, I think he's right about 99% of the time. There are times when he's not. Maybe it's less than that. But he's, he's at least a solid interpreter of Scripture. Okay, here's what he says. Many people consider this, chapter 5, verses 12 to 21, to be the most difficult passage in the epistle. So here we have clearly the most highly theological letter that Paul writes. Some have called it his magnum opus. Right? And MacArthur says this is considered to be the most difficult passage. At first reading, it seems complex and enigmatic. And in one sense, it is. As will be discussed later, as far as complete human comprehension is concerned, the truths of this passage are beyond reach. <coughs> That's from John MacArthur. That gave me some pause and a little bit of grace, right? Whoa. John's saying this is a tough passage. Watch out. But hey, if John's saying this is a tough passage, praise God. <laughs> Okay, so, um, but on the other hand, the truths themselves are wonderfully simple and clear when accepted in humble faith as God's word, just as it is just as it is, as it is possible to, yeah, it is possible to accept and live in accordance with the law of gravity, 
without fully understanding it, so it is possible for believers to accept and love according to God's truth without fully understanding it. Schreiner, one of the other commentators that I use, says this, Romans 5, 12 to 21 is one of the most difficult and controversial passages to interpret in all of Pauline literature. Morris, many of you know Morris, famous commentator, says, just as Adam was the head of, of a race of sinners, so Christ is the head of a new race, the redeemed people of God. The argument is very condensed, and in all translations and comments, we must allow for the possibility that Paul's meaning may at some point be other than we think. But we must not exaggerate this. The main lines of the argument are clear. So this passage is a very complex passage. Uh, and like I said, when I was 11 pages in with one verse, now there's more to it, right? There's some intro and all of that. But uh, it dawned on me that this one was going to be tough, right? So we're going to read the whole passage, and then we'll begin looking at, um, at verse 12 today. Okay? So here we go. Romans 5, it's on the top of your handout. Verses 12 to 21. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. <clears throat> Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, so as a football coach, we often will talk to our linebackers, right? So they're reading the play as it develops in front of them, and we'll tell them to blur their vision. Right? See the movement rather than an individual. When you see the movement, you'll get a sense for where the play is going. Blur your vision. That's all I could think of as I was interpreting this. Blur your vision. If you blur your vision, the, and of course, obviously I'm not asking you to do that. That's the way mine looks all the time now. But as you blur your vision, when you look at this passage and you kind of pull out what you see is a marvelous picture of grace in the name of Jesus Christ, right? Who brought righteousness for those who believe. Justification, same word, justification and righteousness. For those who believe, covering the sin of Adam that went to all humanity. And Paul is simply giving us two realms, right? The realm of uh, sin and death initiated by Adam and the realm of grace and righteousness initiated by Christ for those who believe. That's what Paul's doing here. Okay? So when you draw out, that's it. We can close our, our notebooks and our Bibles and go eat donut holes. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not kind of the nature of our class, right? We're going to go way more in depth than that. I think, though, that that's important for us to start there. To say, yes, there are some complexities in this passage. 
But ultimately, the passage is pretty simple as well. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go through this. Uh, also keep in mind that if guys like Schreiner and Moo and Morris and MacArthur see this passage and say, yeah, there's some things we probably shouldn't be super dogmatic on, probably we should take that same approach. Number two, uh, hermeneutics, which is what again? Yeah, how we interpret scripture. Um, hermeneutics are uh, a major, major thing in this. As we interpret this, uh, it's really, really important that we don't read into scripture what is not there. There's a quote I'll share with you that'll probably be uh, probably in September by the time we get there, but um, there's a quote in this um, that I, I, as I was reading through Moo's commentary, um, where he talks about the significance of not reading into Scripture. <clears throat> like, we may want it to say this. And he says, systematic the theologians may need to have it say this for their system. But it doesn't say that. And so we need to be cautious. And then he says, on the other hand, that doesn't mean we should just ignore it either, right? And so we, can we harmonize it or not? But we have to be cautious not to read into this passage something that Paul did not intend or did not write. Right? It's hard to say what he intended. I mean, all we know is what he wrote. Okay? Of course, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so um, as we approach this passage, I think that's very important. I'm not going to go through the whole introduction for time's sake that you see at the beginning of your notes that's, that I include in your notes all the time. But remember, ultimately, that Romans is the gospel. This is Paul's presentation of the gospel. And it is super, super rich in theology. It is super rich in doctrine. And for those people who would rather, like, well, you know, I just want to talk about Jesus' love. Well, you do so at great risk because Scripture talks about much more than the love of Christ. right? It also talks about judgment for those without Christ. And, and so it's really, really important that we understand those concepts. And so Paul begins his gospel presentation to the Roman church with Romans 1, uh, verse 18 on to 3, ultimately 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And of course, Romans 1, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. Repeatedly, this is what you want? Okay. Right? This is man's sinfulness. And then in chapter 3, in verses 21 to 26, Paul has the development then of the doctrine of justification through belief, through faith. Sola fide, the great concept that we attach to the reformers. That's what Paul says. And then he develops that. And of course, in chapters 5 through 8, which we've just begun, uh, chapters 5 through 8 are the hope of Jesus Christ. Okay? And then Paul comes back and says, we need to deal with Israel. That's chapters 9 through 11. And then chapter 12 is a call for unity, because Paul, I have found, always does that. He teaches some intense doctrine, and then he says, you're all a bunch of knuckleheads. That's what the Greek actually translates to. Um, he says, you're all a bunch of knuckleheads. I give you theology, and what do you do? You immediately split off, and you fight. Paul gives a theological doctrine, and then he talks about the, the need for unity, which we see in Romans 12. And from Romans 12 on through the rest of the book is the application. In other words, now that you're a believer, this is how you should act. By the way, that's a very consistent theme in all of Pauline literature. Okay? This is the doctrine. Don't be dumb. This is how you should, how you should live. In light of this teaching that I've given to you. Again, justification by faith. Um, I think it's important that we always come back to this. Justification, justification 
can only be experienced by faith in God's activity because of the universal rebellion against God that rendered all peopleless, all people powerless under the power of sin. Okay? So justification. God's sacrifice of His Son Christ enabled Him to rescue people from the power of sin without violating His justice. So in our small group we were talking about um, we were reading this a chapter this week and, and we were talking about how we often contrast God's justice and God's mercy. Like if there's more of this then there's less of this. right? There's one or the other. That's not true. God is perfectly just and God is perfectly merciful. We know that God is perfectly just. That's why Christ had to go to the cross for us. Because God is perfectly just. And what you and I deserve was placed on Christ in our stead. God is also perfectly love. Because even though that's what we deserve, He gave His Son for us. And so there's not some, like, you know, a 60% helping of justice and a 40% helping of, of mercy and grace. God is perfectly both of those things. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Would you mind, could you go back? What was the word right after universal? <coughs> Justification can only be experienced by faith in God's activity because of the universal rebellion against God that rendered all people helpless under the power of sin. And uh, I wonder if that would be better said that the universal nature. Put the nature in there just for a second. Uh, justification can only be experienced by faith in God's activity because of the universal nature of man of man against God that rendered all people helpless under the power of sin. I'm just I'm just thinking of the origins of sin, right? Not just act, not just the action of sin, but the origin of sin, which yeah. is our nature. Sure. Okay. Just just which is just an thinking, interesting point, and we'll actually through. get into that in verse twelve because um, Moo will argue that the sin that is Paul's talking about in verse twelve is actually when we talk about Adam's sin and our sin, right? We make this leap that that there's a sin nature that is passed on, which we all believe, right? We all believe that. But we make the we make the leap in this passage and the passage doesn't actually say it. What Paul according to Moo and I think Moo might be right, uh, what Paul is saying is we are also guilty of that same sin of rebellion. So we have the sin nature, which then enables us to make that rebellious decision. Yep. Okay, and again, this rescue is only obtained when people respond in faith. In this great passage of justification, Romans 3, verse 22, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. And I'm not going to go through all my notes here for time's sake, and I don't think you have them anyway um, in this handout. But remember, justification, the word to justify would be like saying to righteousify. It's the same word. Okay? And so it is a legal verdict. It is a le legal verdict that is rendered. So you stand guilty before God. Apart from Christ, the verdict is eternal death, which is not, you know, annihilation. It is instead eternity in hell. You stand before God through belief in Christ. Christ stands with you, in you, however you want to say that. Um, and that then justifies you. God renders you not guilty because He has taken your guilty verdict, the sin verdict, the punishment of sin, and placed it on His Son, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? You track through all of that? It is a legal verdict rendered by a judge. That's what the word means. So you have been made righteous, not by your action, but because the judge has rendered you righteous based on the action of Christ. Okay? 
And we'll talk later about Arian, um, sorry, Arminianism and Pelagianism and some of those things later. But justification is the declaration by God that the believing sinner is made right before God because the demands of the law are fulfilled through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, um, and I'm not going to, again, I'm skipping a little here in my notes, uh, but the hope provided by gospel, by the gospel of the glory of God. Well, you'll remember we talked about the transition in the letter from chapter 4 to 5, um, that Paul is now moving to the hope that the gospel provides. And we see that in verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then this section ends in Paul's letter at the end of chapter 8 with these words, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, this is where our many brothers get it wrong. If you secure your salvation, how tight can you hang on to that rope? Or as Jonathan Edwards described it, the web that dangles you over the, the eternal pit. How tightly can you hold on to that? Luckily, it's not you that holds you. Right? Jesus holds us. We are secured by God in our faith. And so again, um, there are these different themes, but ultimately it is the old reign of sin inaugurated by the sin of Adam and the new reign of righteousness inaugurated by the obedience of Christ. And I think it's really important we say this for those who believe. Right? This is not universalism. We're not in any way suggesting that Christ's activity saved everybody. Obviously, we know that's not the case. So now as we move into verse 12 today, you have in your notes uh, where it says, Introduction, the hope of glory, the reign of grace and life. And it starts with difficult passage to interpret. Well, I've already read my quotes uh, to you for that. This is a very, very important passage. It is a bird's eye view of the history of redemption. Douglas Moo suggests, and again, Moo is um, the commentary that I use predominantly. Moo suggests that this rivals chapter 3, verses 21 to 26 for its theological importance. Well, that's a big statement, right? Because 21 to 26 is where we talk about justification by faith. Moo holds that this section is that level. And it's super complex. So it's important that we, I think, spend some time on it. So, the history of redemption. This is, has universal application. I don't mean by that universalism. Right? Universalism is the idea that all people are saved because of the action of Christ. That's not what we're talking about. Rather, what we're talking about here is the idea that Paul, for the first time, does not delineate Jew and Greek, or Jew and Gentile. Okay? This is salvation for all, again, who believe. It's universal in its application to either Jewish believers or Gentile believers. He talks instead about Adam and Christ. So we're talking about all humanity. All humanity is judged according to its relationship to one of two men, Adam and Christ. Of Adam, his act of disobedience leads to sin and death. And if you are of Christ, Christ's act of obedience leads to righteousness and life for those who believe. And as Moo puts it, both have epical, ep epical significance. They are hugely important. They are the beginning of a new epoch. Right? Adam begun the epoch. He lived in the garden with Eve. They were without sin. And then they chose to sin. That initiated a new epoch in history, in the history of humanity. That epoch was maintained until the death of Christ. 
Okay? Christ, of course, Adam to death, Christ to life. The power of Christ reigns over, on top of, above. It defeats the death of Adam for those who believe. The power of Christ reigns over the death of Adam that sin brought for those who believe. And the theme of this section is the power of Christ's act of obedience to overcome Adam's act of disobedience. And here's what Moo says. We must not so f narrowly focus on what the passage has to say about sin that we fail to do justice to this theme. Let me say that again. See, this passage deals a lot. 12, 13, 14, and then there's contrasts in 15 and 16 and 17. This passage deals a lot with Adam's sin and the resulting death. Moo makes the point, and he is absolutely correct, that we must not focus so much on sin and death that we miss that Christ's reign defeats the power of sin and death inaugurated by Adam. So that's where we, like, it's important for us to blur our eyes and see the significance of this. Can I distract for a moment? Sure. The comment was made about the nature of man. <clears throat> and I'm thinking that when God created Adam and Eve, their nature was not sinful. No. Until Satan came along and taught them how to be rebellious. And so I'm, I'm just trying to make the distinction between our nature... Mm -hmm. God gave us a good nature. Satan destroyed it and ruined it. Now, after that, now we do have the nature of sin. Yep. Okay? So our nature has become sinful because of our rebellious giving in to Satan's um, advertising. But we have to be careful, of course, of the ditch of Pelagianism. So Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism taught that we could choose, Pelagius himself taught we could choose to be good, right? That there was a choice. So we could ignore the tempting of Satan and be good. Or, of course, we could rebel, um, which is biblical heresy. So then that comes back to the nature of the man. Nature. Yep. Which, the, which is passed down through humanity. Yeah. Yep. So, which is the assumption that we make in this passage, though it's not actually in this passage. We'll talk about that okay. later. Yeah. yeah, one of my friends has written a book <clears throat> based on this. It makes it easy for someone like me, and she calls it the authentic self, the, the, what God intended from the beginning, and the adaptive self, because it, in Christ we find out, hey, we are falling short of our authentic <laughs> design and so we you know we've adapted behaviors in the flesh and, and then we realize somewhere along the line that isn't who we really are we are really someone other than you know whatever we've learned culturally and so forth and adapted to so we need to find the nature that God intended for us well and I so I can I mean I can buy into some of that but we have to be really cautious cautious again of Pelagianism and semi -Pelagianism. Well this is not at a real deep level yeah. but I mean just and it, it makes sense at, a, at just a human simple level that you know if, if you continue to believe you are what culture has taught you from your childhood you know. See, I think what, I, what I'm uncomfortable with is what culture has taught you. In other words, the idea that you could be that if it weren't for the name culture. And I would suggest that our nature is such... Apart from culture? Like if you were to... Well, I mean apart from the fall. From the apart from the fall, yes. Yes, see, that's, that would be the distinction for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to point out, like I think we can clearly see that man has sin nature. We can see that we're sinful from birth. David says that in Psalm 51.5. Um, we see that throughout Scripture. There is clearly a principle that sin has been passed through Adam, through the man, right? I mean, we know that. I'm not debating that. We'll talk about original sin in this. What we have to be careful, though, is that Paul doesn't say that in this text. So we have to be cautious 
to not make connections that Paul doesn't make as we exegete this. Now, we can harmonize it. Does that make sense? And so, what you'll hear me say as we teach this pretty complex passage, we'll talk about sin nature and original sin that's passed on, but we'll talk about that in the way of it being harmonized throughout Scripture rather than what Paul says in this passage. Paul may hint at it, but be very, very cautious when you interpret Scripture of looking for the things that you want it to say. Right? We can't do that in good conservative theological circles and then de you know, uh, uh, decry those that do it in other circles. Like, well, you know, Jesus never mentioned homosexuality, so... You see what I'm saying? Like, we have to be very careful when we interpret Scripture. If we're interpreting Scripture, we have to go first from what it says, and then we can try to harmonize. So, I just want us to be cautious. We are going to take a very strict approach to what Paul says, and then we'll try and harmonize it with other things. Does that make sense? That is, by the way, a very sound hermeneutical principle. And when you don't do that, is when you get out into the weeds on a lot of different topics. Okay? So, Kevin, we're slowing you down, and that's okay, right? That's fine. Oh, yeah. Okay. We got 11 pages. This is going to be for a while. Yeah, it takes a while. So, we're really talking about inductive and deductive reasoning. Yes. And we start with inductive reasoning. Mm -hmm. We start with what the passage says. Yep. Right? And we take it literally for what its, its meaning is. Right. And we look at the immediate context. Script, the best number one principle of interpreting Scripture is? Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Yep. We start there. We understand it fully. That's what you're leading us through. Mm -hmm. We then come back, and you're talking about harmonization. Then you you see a picture of what it says, yep. and now you're going to yes, you're going to make some hypothesis of its possible broader meaning, and then you're going to look at the scripture as a whole to see if that hypothesis is correct. Amen. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what we're going to do here. But we have to, be, and I'm just going to be honest with you. If you're like me, so Troy, you probably should pay attention to this. I don't know how many other people are wired the same, but if you're like me, you want to jump to what you already know. Yes. Right? I mean, that's what we do. And so, um, like as I'm reading this, I'm like, well, duh, of course, yeah, sin nature's passed on. That's not what Paul says. Now, Paul doesn't say that that's not the case either. Right? That's an important point. But it's not what Paul says. And so we have to start first with what Paul says. And we have to understand what is Paul's intent based on what he says. And then we try and harmonize from there, or deductive, inductive reasoning from there. So Kevin, we're okay. going to try to behave ourselves and listen, <laughs> rather, rather than tell you all our extensive knowledge of what we think. <laughs> That's what I had to do as I approached the, the commentary. <laughs> so today, we're going to do communion. Yeah. Something we have to do before we recognize and see what Christ did for us. Is we have to confess our sins before we take that cup and that bread, implying we still sin. Absolutely. We all still sin. If we're not for that blood, we're lost. Yep. Amen. And so any notion that we have some kind of inner good, I'm sorry, I can't buy into that for one minute. The only good I have is what Christ has given me. It's His good. It's not me. The reign of the Holy Spirit. Paul will actually talk about that in Romans 6. So we'll spend some time. And Paul even says that, right? Paul talks about him being the chief of sinners. Right? That which I do, that which I don't want to do, I still do. So, yeah, that'll be good. Okay, we're going to stop now. See, we've just barely got into the introduction to the section, much less verse 12, the heavy the heavy part. Let, let me pray for us and uh, get us into church.